We would like to welcome you to our little talk, 3G Investigations, um, which is kind of interesting for us, or was kind of interesting for us to um, yeah, research into this new thing nobody seems to know about, these networks nobody seems to know anything about. And yeah, we want to give you a little overview and some in-deep information, in-depth information that we, that we got and some um, yeah, things for the future we are going to talk about in later talks. Um, sometimes in the past, we dreamed of ubiquitous computer communication and radio technologies should help us. But we had some difficulties with congestion control of the, of the TCP protocol and the bursty nature of failures on radio uh, Wi-Fi links. Um, our problem was, well, in, in the history, there were some problems, several problems with the communication. Um, maybe we all know the uh, slow GPRS links and uh, the G, uh, 3G networks like UMTS, uh, HSDPA and things um, were told that they are the solution for all the problems we maybe have, uh, we sure have. And after thinking, um, TCP with selective acknowledgements, uh, the RC2018 was found and was created. And some billion euros later, when we got that idea of 3G UMTS networks, we got another problem. Um, we got strange delays, obscure packet losses, or, and nobody seems to know why we got that. If anyone tried to use some, uh, uh, some of the U, uh, UMTS uh, services to date, um, might have um, experienced some of that thing. St strange delays, it's really, really slow. It, packet losses everywhere. And well, nobody can tell you why. Nobody can tell you what happens. Nobody can tell you why it happens. Um, and that's the point of our interest. We want to know why, what, and um, how we can shift around that. So the contents of our little talk. Um, point one, UMTS network details, some uh, information about the network top topologies, uh, the BDP context, um, how it's built, how it works. Um, from uh, outside, when you look uh, to it outside, from the outside, um, how quality of service within UMTS networks um, is made, and how charging of user data and that uh, kind of interesting things like a lawful interception is done within UMTS and where it's done. Um, point two of our presentation is um, how we um, try to get into that net, uh, these networks and um, how the networks are re realized. Um, you, may know, you may know that there, there are uh, several uh, network operators in Germany, like uh, uh, T-Mobile and Vodafone. And we did some basic measurements and uh, had some, information, uh, some ideas about uh, advanced measurements. And then uh, in the last part of our presentation, we want to give you some information about how you maybe shift around the problems, how you uh, could maybe in the future um, do some more sophisticated solutions um, uh, than just opening a, a VPN or something. So my colleague will tell you something about UMTS network details. Okay. Oh, it's still working. 
Um, as Dan Daniel told you, uh, I will give you now a short introduction into the UMTS uh, network topology. Go on. Um, on the left side, you see, um, I hope you can see it. Oh, no gray color. Um, on the left side, you see the uh, UTRAN. It's a UMTS radio access network. Unlike uh, cheaper uh, uh, radio technologies like VLAN, uh, the radio access network uh, within UMTS is divided into uh, two major parts. There is first the node B, and second the radio network controller. The node B is uh, more or less just the antenna on the top of each building and the radio network controller does the more uh, powerful, powerful things um, with the package. Um, but both are more or less unimportant for us, but there's one interesting detail in normal UMTS. Um, the acknowledgement on packets received from the cellular phone are generated by the RNC. This is a nice idea when you want to uh, have a soft or softer, or really, really soft handover. It's all possible with UMTS, but it's uh, very slow. UMTS uh, will take up about 80 uh, milliseconds uh, to detect and packet lost. And this will uh, have a uh, deep impact on the performance of our network later on. There's a new technology, it's called uh, HSDPA. This um, is really better, it will only take two milliseconds to uh, detect a packet loss. Um, this is uh, possible because and this technology in the Node B is far more intelligent and can react on packet loss directly and not their RNC is um, used for this. Um, the next um, important part of our network is the uh, serving GPIS support node uh, or SGSN. It's more or less uh, responsible for session setup and management, mobility management, subscriber database management, and uh, charging of uh, the radio network usage. Um, also not really um, important for us. Only the last thing will be uh, interesting later on the uh, charging functions of UMTS. So keep this in mind. And the last thing um, on this slide is a GGSN or Gateway GPS support, no support note. <coughs> this is uh, rather, rather interesting because um, this is um, more or less the gateway from UMTS to the normal networks like the internet or uh, to your VPN if you have a contract with your um, UMTS provider, or uh, for the IP porno movie subsystem, or soccer subsystem, or just multimedia subsystem, uh, there is something like, call, uh, like this subsystem, at least in the UMTS standards, as you can uh, see, top of the slide. If you will just go to Google and type in uh, the 3G PP TS. Uh, uh, may I interrupt? You can see, uh, you can cannot oh, see it yes. on, the, on the. The beamer projector. is uh, some kind has some kind of um, problems. The slides are available mm -hmm. online, so later on you can, when you have a Google link. Okay, there should be a reference uh, to the UMTS standard. Just get the slides. Um, yes, um, the GGSN is responsible for um, connecting the UMTS network to other networks. 
it's um, responsible to give you an IP address to do some network address transformation translation or uh, for people who like mobile IP it could be responsible um, for doing things like foreign agents the really interesting things um, the GGS and is responsible for is data uh, user data screening and security this sounds interesting. Um, it's more or less today just a firewall and it's also responsible for charging the bytes you send from UMTS to other networks or the bytes you receive from the internet. Um, next thing is the packet data protocol context. This is more or less um, a tunnel. It's between your mobile equipment and this GGSN because you want to um, do rooming and move around and nothing should uh, interrupt your session. This is uh, quite a nice thing for UMTS. It's uh, aware of mobility and it's aware of quality of service. Um, you can even have more than one of these contexts, but you have mm, some problems with the design of the PDP context, which will be on the next slide. Um, also, there's no uh, possibility for the mobile device to um, initiate a context modification. The mobile device can set this tunnel up or can take it down, but if it's um, set up, there's no uh, possibility to change any of the details of this tunnel. Um, and again, another tunnel is used, or some people just call it PPP, um, to do another session context between your mobile device and the GTSN. There's n not really any kind of use from this, but provider like PPP, as you can see uh, uh, at home with your DSL, there's also sorry, and there's also um, PPP over Ethernet, but there's no use for it, really. Okay, and the PDP context, as I told you, um, is characterized by the network address. It can be an IP4, IP version 4 or version 6 address um, or an IP version 6 prefix. This is, sounds interesting for us. Cisco also supports network behind mobile feature. And there can you uh, just add routing entries in the GTSN and have more than one IP address on your mobile device. Um, as far as I know, no other vendor supports this feature today. Um, you all may know from uh, UMTS or GPIS these access point names. It's just um, the endpoint of a tunnel where you want to connect to. It's some kind of a DNS name for uh, for the GGSNs, because when you set up the, uh, your session, um, you don't want to connect to a specific GGSN, but to a GGSN would, uh, which can uh, handle your connection with a special service or something else. Uh, Vodafone has, uh, as far as I know, two access point names. The old one, wap.vodafone.de or the newer one web.vodafone.de. Um, T-Mobile, I think they only have the internet.td1.de access point name. And last but not least, the QoS level is also characterizing the PDP context. And this is a bit a problem because it's, uh, it's nice to have quality of service in UMTS, but it's not really working as you might expect it. You have uh, four classes of quality of service, the conversational class for 
really uh, high priority data with uh, guarantees. But as you can see, 80 milliseconds isn't really fast. And this is the best class in UMTS. There's a streaming class, a bit uh, more delay. Then the last two classes have no guarantees. It's just priority. Um, they are more or less for normal uh, web browsing or background services like email, FTP, and so on. This would be nice to have uh, at least some of the classes, but um, your PDP context has only one quality of service um, indication. So when you want to have more than one quality of service, uh, you might, uh, when you do multimedia streaming or so, it would be nice to send some packages or some frames of the streaming the high priority and all the not so important frames with a lower priority. And this would be very nice to have, um, but it's not possible with UMTS because you have only one context. You could have more than one context, but as far as I know, no renderer of a mobile phone does this support today. Um, another thing is the quality of service is uh, only supported within UMTS. There are no, um, no ways to indicate the quality of, quality of service level to the normal internet or other networks because the UMTS will reclassify all packets um, who come in or come go out with the Q quality of service level you will have um, in your PDP context. Or, uh, this means all this serve tags or type of service or class of service tags in your IP packets will be deleted. Um, if you look at the standard, um, you will see um, a round trip time in UTRAN of about 120 milliseconds and in the core network of 20 seconds. Um, this is really slow and will um, have a deep impact on the slow start fast of TCP. When you start downloading, it will be really, really slow and it will take a long time for the TCP session to get to a higher speed. And when you lose some packets, uh, it uh, will re also take a long time to, ge to get a retransmission of these packets. So most of the time, the UMTS won't give you any data because it's waiting for timeouts or then something else. Okay, and this to quality of service. Another interesting thing we found is charging within UMTS. Most vendors think it's not long enough to uh, only pay for uh, using the service or to have a flat rate or to have the old um, local call and far away call. Um, distinction. They want to have a sophisticated billing system and want to, yes, uh, let you pay for more or less every bit you transmit. This means um, sooner or later you will have the possibility to send voice over P over your UMTS telephone, but it will cost you uh, quite uh, a lot more than just sending an email or something else. So far, the theory of the uh, vendors. There are a lot of possibilities to get to your money. Um, but at the moment, um, the charging is limited to the PDP context. If you have one PDP context and you send one megabyte of data, you will have to pay for one megabyte of data. It's not important uh, what kind of data you are sending. 
But this new concept is called uh, IP flow analysis, and it will base on different uh, the types um, of data. This um, can be, uh, if you look into the standard, for example, BULs, also uh, Microsoft.com may be more expensive to view than CCC.de or so. Oh, no, I don't think CCC.de would work. Um, SIP could be more expensive. Port numbers could be more expensive. For example, uh, using uh, HTTPS could be more expensive than using HTTP. And another thing is the real IP flow analysis. Um, when you think of peer-to-peer -peer or uh, internet games where you have a lot of uh, open ports and a lot of different kind of data, you want to uh, have some kind of aggregation of this data. Um, but, um, so that you don't have more than 1,000 entries in the charging database, but only one. Um, the amount of data is still a problem, and when you think of uh, cheap providers like e -plus or so, they already give you a flat rate for GPS, and I think in the next days also for UMTS. This is not because they want to be nice to you, but they have a real problem with charging. Um, but again, it's not really clear if it's uh, in the future um, good for them to give you a flat rate because they have to keep all your records anyway because the law enforcement agencies of the uh, European Union will force them to do so. So if they can keep your data anyway, they can also analyze your data and uh, get more money from you for your transmissions. So conclusions for the part one of our lecture. Um, the UMTS packet switch domain is far more complex than technologies you know, like VLAN or the upcoming WiMAX. The most interesting part for us is, uh, is the GTSN, where packets can be filtered or charged or perhaps delayed. And with the upcoming IP multi multimedia subsystem or SACA subsystem, charging of individual IP flows will become of interest. I don't think in the next year to the um, uh, soccer games in Germany, but perhaps in two or three years. And if they do so, we just want to have some fun with their doings and will analyze their doings uh, today and have probably some fun with the hack value inside this IP flow analysis. So I'm ready with part one and I will give back to uh, Daniel from the next part. Yeah, the next part is get to know your network. Um, we, we've got uh, several devices uh, for our research. Um, first, um, these small HTC universal devices, um, which can handle UMTS quite well. And uh, secondly, um, such a PCMCA card, PC card uh, from Vodafone. Um, we paid for them. They did not um, give them for, for our researchers. And we had um, some plans to deal with uh, E-plus in Germany also, but they were not able to deliver us a uh, card in time, um, which means three months. <laughs> okay, let's start with Vodafone, um, which is formerly known as D2 in Germany. Um, when you set up, when you all set up, your tunnel to the GGSN. You're um, part of an internal private network um, in a 10.0.0.0.8 network and no IPv6 is available. 
um, they do network address translation and um, you normally have an external IP um, which changes from time to time but normally it's, it's the given IP here at the moment. There are many, many uh, transparent application layer proxies which uh, interfere with your data um, like um, they uh, transcode and resize and reshape, re-encode everything you see on screen. Um, when you use that uh, Vodafone card and use the software that comes with it, you for example see all, you're seeing all pictures on websites in uh, a really bad, bad quality and just when you reload uh, several pictures or the, or the pictures you want to see in better quality, you get a full detail picture uh, with full size. And then you are experiencing the real speed of UMTS, uh, which is quite slow. My colleague told you about the slow start, which takes quite about uh, three to five seconds, which is not enough for a 100 kilobyte image. So you are getting the image not in the, be in, in the um, high speed mode of your UMTS network, you are getting it really, really slow. Um, in our um, measurements, we got um, over the 100 kilobyte per second, um, which, mostly, which we mostly arrive with cacheable data. Um, for example, FTP or uh, HTTP connections. So um, they are properly, uh, probably, probably using uh, transparent application layer proxies for this. And from time to time, you ca you also get above that uh, 100 kilobyte. But uh, 100 kilobyte is um, known as the ma maximum speed you're getting when you're completely alone on uh, such an access point, uh, such an internet, uh, uh, yeah, such a point. Um, on on good links, so when you have uh, full reception, full quality, your packet loss is up to three percent, um, which is not really good for TCP and not really good for the speed. As you, as we told, um, 120 milliseconds for uh, packet loss detection and resending uh, is not included in this time. Um, will cause very very long delays. Um, in our measurements from 293 milliseconds to 494 uh, uh, milliseconds, which is uh, some kind of, um, um, which sounds faster than you might think, but there are some uh, measure points that are above two seconds, above four seconds, um, which come very, very, uh, often. Um, there are some hints, some point, uh, things that point us to packet filtering and delaying because on some access points we used, uh, there are uh, some ports were, were closed to the outside world and even some ports were hardly delayed, uh, more or less. Um, uh, IP packets with the record road enabled are dropped. Uh, no packet forwarding between the user equipment, uh, which we did not expect, really expected that it, they will allow us to communicate between the devices. But, mm, well, could be fun if they would. Um, DNS and TCP seems to have slightly higher priority. Um, you can see it um, when just p uh, pinging UDP port uh, 53, you get um, uh, ping times from about uh, 50 to 80 milliseconds uh, when there's no packet loss. And um, pinging another UDP port, let's say uh, 666, you get ping times from the very long delays above, I mentioned earlier. Um, uh, as I told, the cacheable data seems to perform best 
um, but the slow start is uh, is some point well you you have to wait before the data flows uh, quite in high speed uh, one and a half kilobyte is okay when you download a larger file like 10 megabyte or up but you need to wait until the uh, file is cached and the TCP slow start start uh, is getting in flow so you can receive the 100 kilobyte well only if you're alone on that access point um, the IP uh, the iperf uh, test tool doesn't perform uh, well uh, which we think is uh, caused by the transparent uh, transparent proxies that uh, might detect that test or might not handle that uh, and just yeah delaying what they can um, we know from Vodafone that they are planning to uh, implement several uh, filters and uh, delaying rules uh, like for voice over IP known uh, commonly used voice over IP ports from July 2007 on um, as we think uh, they might test it uh, at the moment but mostly no um, no uh, filtering or something is taking place um, on some access points I had some problems to access several ports on other access points I did not um, depends where you are depends uh, what the software version which we don't know uh, is on that access point by mostly I think by ports and content uh, since they are using transparent proxies and they are planning to charge uh, by, uh, by content, they are uh, they, they they are they will most likely uh, filter on both. The port filtering is easy. The content filtering takes much more CPU performance, but um, you can think of both. Okay, um, we tested. We also tested the T-Mobile, uh, formerly known as D1 in Germany, um, which has a very, very bad coverage in our uh, places where we tested, which just means you're constantly, ch uh, constantly roaming between uh, GPRS and uh, UMTS, um, which is handled, uh, which is handled by the uh, network quite well. But uh, with that come some packet losses and huge delays up to two to four uh, seconds, which just means um, every time your device is uh, handing over to UMTS or GPRS, you have to wait for the resending of the packets that are lost in that uh, part. We had some, uh, well, I had some handovers where no packet were lost, but the second, uh, but the uh, delays are really, really hard to ignore when you just download a web page or uh, doing some streaming. Um, T-Mobile seems to use official IP uh, address space, which just means you uh, you get a real IPv6 uh, address. Which is uh, packet filters anyway? Uh, packet filtered anyways. Um, they have several, several packet filters at the moment, and you uh, can enable a transparent HTTP proxy, which we tested, um, to resize and re-encode, recompress your, your uh, web pages. Um, it does work the same like the Vodafone version of the transparent uh, HTTP proxy. But you can disable it uh, from a uh, T-Mobile service page, and you can um, you cannot switch uh, uh, switch between those both um, without reloading a complete page. Um, in the Vodafone solution, you can just reload one image; don't have to reload a complete page. Um, the delays are similar to the Vodafone solution when you have a uh, good reception and you found a place where you have good reception which means 200 milliseconds up to 600 milliseconds um, 
and because of the bad coverage, um, we think uh, we we don't think that the measurements are representative for uh, all networks of T-Mobile. I think um, they are building the network at the moment uh, because I had uh, several events where uh, the coverage just uh, uh, the reception just got better from day to day. Uh, in, at the same place, uh, in in one place I had 10% uh, uh, reception, which means no reception, and the other day it was 90%. They just it seems that they just set up a, a base station directly in the neighborhood. As I mentioned, uh, we did not uh, get an E plus uh, account at the moment. Um, as we know, they have a GPRS flat rate and they have UMTS flat rate or planning, but... Actually, they have a UMTS flat rate already. Yeah. They have it running for like three months now. Okay. Um, we can wait for the audio, Angel. <laughs> Behave. Well, E plus has a UMTS flat rate for three months now. Yeah, we hope that somebody in the audience could tell something about it. And it works similar to the Vodafone one, except that I think they don't use any proxying to rescale images or any sort of that stuff. Sounds good. You get a yeah, you get a private address and you're netted. What works perfectly fine is that if you run a net on your local notebook you can actually forward data from other laptops through the GPRS or UMTS. Oh, that's So that's cool. pretty nice. That's what I did yesterday when the Wi-Fi didn't work here. <laughs> okay. And um, uh, you do switch in between GPRS and UMTS if you don't have UMTS coverage, but that actually works quite well. Better? Yeah, the, you actually don't really notice a big difference. You just see the difference in speed between UMTS and GPRS. Okay. But the switching goes pretty fast. Uh, can you tell anything about packet losses or? Well, um, with GPRS you have the usual 200 milliseconds to 300 milliseconds delay, which is usual for GPRS. Yeah, of course. You, you've always had that. And with UMTS, since I hardly have UMTS coverage where I live, I didn't really test that a lot, but I tested it yesterday here and it works okay for SSH. So okay. you actually can use SSH, which is all I need, so. With <laughs> 500 millisecond delay between each? Well, no, you actually have a decent rate. Okay. So. Cool, and the packet loss? I didn't test that really, and okay. I didn't do any big downloads, so can't okay. say anything about that. Yeah. I can test that and give you feedback to your email address. Cool, thank you. Um, we will put that information inside the talk uh, slides and uh, we made it available as soon as we got the information here. Um, so you can download and exit it after the talk. So we go on. What did we test? Basic measurements, um, all the standard tools, of course. Ping, ping, minus R, trace route, uh, iperf, Azure ping, nmap. Um, but we, are, we were looking for more integrated tool which could measure the lat latencies and routing of packets using different ports and different protocols and slightly modified packets, which just leads to um, a, a self-made uh, solution because we wanted to use it on, on, on the very mobile devices. And we created a, a tool, a tool set which uh, is a server and a client. The client is on the mobile device, which creates uh, packets and measures the time. And at the moment, it's uh, it's a very simple client. It does work, but there are a lot of things to do. Um, the client application is uh, coded in C sharp, uh, based on the .NET Compact framework, which is quite good uh, for the mobile devices. And the server is made in Java at the moment and will be replaced by a C-sharp version. We uh, did not have the time to uh, rewrite it in time because we're going, uh, running into some issues uh, with the raw IP uh, 
reception and generation in Java that um, are easier to deal with in uh, the C sharp uh, network stack. Um, uh, the server part of the software just provides e echo functionalities, which means you're connecting to the server, telling him uh, what port you want to connect to, and uh, he opens the port and you send data and he uh, replies on that port uh, with the data you send. Um, there are, are some uh, peering functionalities planned to uh, implement into the server. Uh, which is quite easy to implement. We did not have the time uh, to this uh, talk um, to communicate between the devices uh, through the server, um, especially when the devices are net, uh, behind the net. S um, one uh, issue with the compact framework at the moment is that there's no raw IP support. Um, so we had to p-invoke, uh, which just means we have to use uh, device uh, specific code, um, which I, as far as I know will be solved, uh, that problem will be solved in the future. The source code is also available, of the tools is also available uh, where you can get the slides. Um, the addresses are uh, at the last line. Okay, so now I will hand over to my colleague um, when it comes to the last part of the talk, which is adapt your traffic patterns. Okay, um, as you have heard, um, today um, the UMTS network is still a bit boring. Uh, it's working, it's not working very fast, but uh, you're getting your data. Um, there are some services or ports or whatever that you cannot access. Um, the first solution or the poor man's solution would be uh, use a VPN and it's good. It will work. It will increase your delay and y um, yeah, your bits per second will decrease, but it will just work. So. Um, we thought, uh, no, um, UMTS is still so boring, we have to find better solutions to have some fun. The first thing, um, uh, we set up the design rule. We didn't, uh, we don't want to use any kind of VPN or IP tunnel for the main data flow. This means um, most of the packets should be sent directly it's only allowed to send some packages via VPN or inside ICMP packages or something else. Um, because UMTS is really slow enough. And very, very easy example. If you uh, imagine there is a network A and a network B, and there's perhaps some very stupid packet filter. Uh, or GTSM, I don't know. It's uh, up to your imagination. And you want to uh, and connect to a specific port. Uh, you might think of SIP or so, I don't know. Um, the direct way will be um, prohibited by the service provider, um, but in the other way around there will be no um, limitation. Um, and uh, the normal scenario in UMTS is on the w one network you have a um, device under your control and in the other network there's also a device under your control. So you can do really a lot of things. So we uh, thought, um, yes, let's first um, solve this problem with the TCP connections. Uh, the first solution was the minimal routing approach, uh, we call it so. That's no really uh, normal uh, calling for this. Uh, we want just um, send the main data, uh, TCP data in the direct way, but the TCP SYN package 
which is uh, normally dropped in the DGSN or packet filter, should be sent via VPN. Um, so we want to keep the um, overhead as small as possible. Um, at the moment, because we have some troubles with the um, Windows Mobile 5, we just implemented a Linux version just to show you, yes, this could work and this is working. Just use um, these few lines of code, set up your normal IP tunnel, for example, OpenVPN, um, use uh, IP route 2 to register a new routing table, it's just echo. And then use um, NetFilter to do some uh, firewall marking, especially marking the package you want to send through the tunnel. This is nice because um, even when you do direct communication between, between the two devices, you don't run into trouble with IP addresses because when you normally would send through the tunnel, the IP address would change to the IP address of the tunnel. But with this solution, it won't. It's just, um, yes, very trivial. You can do it, just copy paste and do it at home. But uh, keep in mind this solution might not always be optimal if you have a provider or a home network with return pass filtering enabled. Okay, there is nearly no network with the return pass filtering today, but it might. Um, there's another way to do the job. It's the um, way we call minimal modification. It's uh, dedicated to Ambanus somewhere in this room. It's his idea to do the quite the same job I d as I did. Um, his idea was not to send it in another way, but uh, just to do solve the problem directly. The packet is filtered because the TCP soon is set. So just um, you could remove it, but then you might run into troubles with some filters who uh, to do stateful packet filtering or something else. Or who just look uh, at packages and see, oh, no TCP option set, this might be a strange packet and I will drop it. So use uh, uh, just the egg bit, set, the, uh, set additional the egg bit and then it looks like an answer of another station for TCP thin packet. Um, Normally, as far as we know, even the Vodafone GGSN accepts this packet. Um, on both sides, you use um, the NetFilter connection tracking to do your uh, recreation of the SYN bit or removing of the egg bit. Um, because when you, when you get um, a package and there is a SYN egg bit set, but connection tracking says, I don't know this connection, then you know, oh, this could perhaps be a packet of mine and I will just remove the egg bit again and send it again to me. And oh, yes, cool. Now we have a connection setup request. Let's set up this uh, TCP session. Um, the hard stuff is done inside uh, two Perl libraries. It's called NetPacket and IP tables, this just um, some um, queue management and changing of packets, um, recalculating the checksum of the IP packet and TCP, I think, and then you just send the packet um, out again. Um, the code will also be available on the normal web link. So um, I give back to Daniel for the overall conclusions. Um, hello? Uh, hello? Maybe we, okay, yeah, now it's working. Um, so what did we learn about UMTS? UMTS is a great technology for counting, charging, and 
with uh, HSDPA and HSUPA, which is the uplink version of the HSDPA. Perhaps is even uh, good using it. Um, if there are any IP filter delays and special charging in the future, uh, we want to find ways to deal with them um, today before they are set up, uh, probably before they are set up, and they will come. This could lead to an automatic creation of traffic delay maps and adapting our packet flow by using a minimal modified packets. Um, and the big hammer solutions uh, like VPNs are not always the best approach and smarter techniques, uh, smarter technologies are, uh, should be um, preferred. So, now we have uh, five minutes from my clock um, for some questions. Um, you can email us or uh, subscribe to a mailing list. Um, yeah, you mentioned that uh, DNS seems to have higher priority. Did you try setting up an NSTX uh, proxy? You know, where you proxy your packets through uh, DNS text messages? Uh, no, we did not test it. Yeah, you should try that. <laughs>